Today on Detroit Muscle, learn how to convert a classic Chevelle chassis into a modernized monster that can turn and stop with the best of them. The guys have all the goodies to make it happen, so stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Now when the term muscle car is tossed out there for a lot of you at home, the first car that comes to mind is a Chevelle. Same for us. We actually have one of our own here and we found it in a barn. This 72 model hadn't seen the light of day in a few decades, but we got her loaded up on the trailer, then gave her a bath, then she went to the blaster. And after that, we put a new floor in her. With that done, the next thing we gotta do is get this thing back together because I've gotta cut them quarter panels off that body and I can't do it with an owner rotisserie. So that whenever we get this car back together and make it a little easier to move it around in the shop, we gotta get some wheels under this thing. To get our Chevelle's chassis where we need it to be, we're gonna have to do some serious suspension upgrades. And all this stuff you see out on the tables here, well, it comes as one kit from QA1. All of this stuff bolts in the factory location, starting in the rear with these tubular lowers, adjustable uppers, and adjustable trailing arms. It even comes with these polyurethane bushings that bolt into the factory housing. For the front, the kit also comes with these tubular A arms, both upper and lower, which are equipped with QA1's ultimate ball joints. Now those are adjustable for both preload and to help you set your alignment, which is pretty handy. Now to keep our Chevelle flat in those turns, the kit also comes with these heavy duty sway bars, all the mounting hardware, bushings, and sway bar end links. Of course, the kit wouldn't be complete without QA1's double adjustable coilovers. Now, this is for 68 to 72 GMA bodies, which means it's not just for the Chevelle. It'll also fit your El Camino, GTO, 442, or even Buick GS. First thing we're gonna install is lower A arms. We're gonna apply some silicone lubricant to the urethane bushings to make installation a bit easier. Once it's applied to all the outside surfaces, the A-arms can be installed with the help of a dead blow hammer. Using the included hardware, we install the bolts and install the nuts hand tight. These upper A-arms, there's actually two ways to install the cross shaft. On the shallow side, this is a stock location. Now the other side, this is a deeper cutout. It actually gives you an eighth inch more, which gives you more adjustment for negative camber. We're actually gonna use the one with the stock because this is gonna be a street car. The cross shaft installs in the stock location using the included bolts. It's time to start assembling our front shocks. The first thing to go on is this lock nut. We're gonna run this all the way down until it's at the bottom of the threads, no farther than that. Uh, the next thing is gonna be the spring seat. Now that's not where they're gonna be at ride height anyway. Those are actually gonna to be too low, so now's a good time to lubricate those threads with some anti-seas. This is a really important part because if you don't lubricate these threads, it can cause galling and on this aluminum shock body and that'll void your warranty on your shock and that'll be bad because you won't be able to adjust your ride height. Um, another thing is we're using a nickel based anti-seize here and not a copper based. That way it blends in with the shock body and it looks uh, a lot nicer than the copper would. We're also gonna put anti-seize on this thrust washer here. Now we could just use the thrust washer and then put the spring on top of it we're actually gonna be using a thrust bearing as well. So the thrust washer goes on first, then the thrust bearing. Then we'll anti-seize this other thrust washer. And it goes on as well. And that's where your spring sits. The shock gets its upper mount bushing, and after we slide on the spring, the assembly slips into the stock location and gets attached to the frame with the bushing and nut. The lower mount on the coilover gets attached using this adapter bracket.
It bolts to the lower shock mount and gets dropped into the pocket on the lower control arm. Four bolts attach the adapter bracket to the A-arm and get cinched down. Like we said earlier, these ultimate ball joints from QA1, they are adjustable for the preload and they come pretty loose, so we need to get some preload adjusted in here. Comes with all the tools you need to do it, and the first tool is a spanner wrench here. We're just gonna loosen this lock nut first. It also comes with the hex key here, and we're going to insert it open in down. That's what's actually gonna make the adjustment for the pretension. We can usually just tighten it enough by hand to get the pretension we need. If you have a race car or something like that, you may want to put a little more pretension on that. Then we just hold the hex key and tighten that lock nut. The next piece to our puzzle that needs to be installed onto our new chassis is the spindles. Now our plan was to reuse the old ones, but after inspecting them, we got a little bit of an issue. Now if you look here on the top, you can kind of see where the bearing was, but the problem is whenever you spin it over, you can see that the spindle is blued. What's happened here is that bearing got loose and it spun on this stub. And if you try to reuse this thing, well that bearing's going to have a roar to it. So you need to make sure to just swap them out for some new ones. For replacement spindles, we just called up Summit Racing and they had exactly what we were needing. We went ahead and sprayed on a coat of that Duplicolor cast coat to keep this thing from rusting. Now one thing to keep in mind before you install this spindle is to index your ball joints. That may not sound like much, but doing this little tip can make it a lot easier to get that cotter pin in or out later down the road. These new spindles are just like the originals and slip right onto our ball joints. Starting with the lower, we attach it with the standard castle nut, which gets tightened and secured with a cotter pin. The same goes for the top. Just tighten that nut and install the cotter pin to keep it in place. Up next, learn how to measure and set up an aftermarket brake system, as well as adapting brackets to accept a beefed up rear end. Hey guys, thanks for coming back to see us. While you were gone, I bolted in the sway bar, but I'm gonna have to wait to put the link on it until we get this thing sitting on the ground because I need that control arm to come up just a bit. But that's no big deal. So the next thing to do that, we need to put some brakes on this thing. And Mr. Mark over there, he's got something he wants to show you. Since our Chevelle was originally equipped with drum brakes all the way around, we decided to upgrade to aftermarket disc brakes. So we turned to Bear Brakes for one of its Bear Claw Pro Plus kits. This is a 13 inch kit, so it comes with the 13 inch drilled and slotted rotors. These are two piece, so they have an aluminum hat, makes them more lightweight. It comes with their six piece, six piston compact calipers in your choice of colors. We chose black and it also comes with the pads. And the best thing about this kit is that it's designed specifically for 68 to 72 A bodies. It comes with everything you need to install it, like the brake hose, all the mounting hardware, and this hub that mounts to our stock spindle. First thing though, caliper bracket. This aluminum bracket is side specific, so make sure you have the right one. The bolts slide through the bracket and the spindle, followed by the steering arm. Those can then be tightened up because they're not going anywhere. The adapter plate is next, which can be tightened for now, but we'll need to shim it up later. The hubs come fully assembled with pre-packed bearings already inside. It's followed up by the castle nut, then a trusty old cotter pin and a fancy aluminum dust cap. The rotor can then go on and be held in place with a lug nut or two. The caliper sits on the adapter plate and gets snugged down for now. As you can see here, there's more gap on the inside of the rotor than there is on the outside, so we need to shim that caliper out just need to take some measurements to see how far we need to shim it. We'll take a couple of measurements on each side and get an average. The first measurement is 751 thousandths, followed by 765. And on the other side, 563. With about 200 thousandths difference, we're going to remove the caliper, loosen the caliper adapter plate, and install 100 thousandths in spacers between the caliper bracket and the adapter plate.
Those get tightened, and with the caliper back in place, we can check our measurements. Our new measurements range from 651 thousandths to 665 thousandths. So, we're good. With the brakes buttoned up, we're going to move on to the steering. So, we went to year one and got us a quick ratio steering box. This has got a 12 to 1 ratio. It'll turn from lock to lock in two and three quarter turns. What that means is that'll help us old Chevelle whenever you start snatching on that steering wheel. I'm going to go ahead and get this stuff bolted in. See y'all in a few. Stick around and we'll get our new rear end plugged into our Chevelle chassis. Hey, welcome back. While you were gone, we got our brand new rear end busted out of the crate and we've got it here in the paint booth. Check this thing out. This is Curry Enterprises bolt-in rear end for the A body. So it's got all the provisions and mounts to bolt directly into your Chevelle, El Camino, GTO, or any other A body of that era. We got ours with the fabricated F9 housing and back brace, 35 spline true track differential, of course, 35 spline axles, and the provisions for those bare brakes. Now, when we ordered ours, we ordered it bare because we weren't sure what color we were going to go with at the time. So now we just need to get this thing cleaned up, get a couple of coats of paint on it to protect it from the elements. Since the rear end came with the axles already installed, we're going to pull those out first, followed by the T-bolts and bump stops. A little bit of brake parts cleaner and a Scott shop towel will clean off all the oil and residue that would keep our paint from sticking. A little bit of masking tape will keep any overspray out of our housing, and the same goes for the vent tube. We also mask over the center section since it's done been painted. To coat our rear end, we decided to go with VHT's high temperature roll bar and chassis paint. Now this is ideal for this because our rear end's bare and this doesn't require the use of a primer. It's gonna keep corrosion, rust, and chemicals from getting into that rear end housing. The first coat needs to be sprayed on light and evenly to provide a good surface for the other coats to stick to. We're using our paint booth, but you can use a well-ventilated area of your choice to do this job. After a 10 minute flash time, the second coat can go on. This is a medium coat that should provide us plenty of coverage, but we'll go ahead with a third coat just for good measure. Well, Mark's got that rear all shined up and it's ready to slide up under our frame. I went ahead and installed our QA1 links and we're just about ready to install this thing. But we're gonna do a coilover conversion on this car and back in the day, well, they wasn't thinking about coilovers in any form or fashion. Now, QA1 offered a set of these brackets that's gonna adapt it for us and all we have to do is drill a couple of extra holes. This bracket bolts to the original lower shock mount bracket on the rear end. And after drilling a pilot hole, we upsize bits to accept a 7 16th inch bolt. Just blow off those metal shavings, drop in the bolt, and cinch it down. This bracket mounts to the frame, and two of the bolt holes are already existing. So we install and tighten those two first, which helps line us up to drill out the frame for our third bolt. Tell me when, big guy. All right, let's try that. The upper control arms slide onto the mounts attached to the rear end and bolt into place. Detroit Muscle presents Back to Basics, tips for the beginner gearhead. When you're doing a full suspension install like we're doing on our Chevelle, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. One of those is the type of bushings you use in your control arms. The first type is rubber stock style bushings. These are good because the ride quality is really nice and you don't have to lubricate them, but over time they like to dry rot and crack and there's a lot of deflection built into those, especially in a high performance application. On the other end of the spectrum are solid mounts like this solid rod end here. These are great because there's absolutely no deflection built in. So this is good for like a race car. The problem is you're gonna feel every little bump in the road. So there's gotta be something in the middle. That's where these urethane bushings come in. They have all the benefits of a stock style mount, but without all the deflection. You gotta make sure you lube them up because if you don't, when you install them, they're gonna make some noise. And that's why they get a bad rap. 
With our lowers bolted in as well, all of our control arms can be tightened. Now it's time for our rear coilovers to mount to those brackets that we installed earlier. The rear sway bar is next, and with a little bit of persuasion, bolts to the lower control arms and gets tightened down. We added the bare brakes, and our rear is ready to roll. Still ahead, we'll take a look at how to mount brake lines for great looks and reliability. Hey guys, glad you made your way back. Now we're just about to the finish line with assembling our chassis for our 72 Chevelle project. The next task at hand is going to be installing the brake lines. Now to save us a bit of time, we went to year one and got us a full stainless steel kit for a 68 to 72. With it being stainless steel, you don't have to worry about it rusting or anything like that, and it's going to stay looking good for a long time. The kit includes both of them for the rear axle, the line that runs from the front to the rear of the car, both up front, left and right, and the ones that run down from the master cylinder. Now we're not going to worry about installing these quite yet because we're going to have to install an adjustable proportioning valve, but we'll cross that bridge later down the road. The first line we're going to install is the long one that runs along the frame rail from the front to the back of the car. To strap it to the frame, we're tapping out the existing holes so that we can fasten the lines with a cushion clamp and ARP hardware. We'll do this all the way down in the same locations that the original mounts were located. Then we'll give the rest of our lines the same treatment. Son. When it came to wheels and tires for our Chevelle, we wanted to go with something with a stock look, but with a twist. So we went to year one for a set of their exclusive 17 inch Magnums. These are reproductions of the originals, but in a larger diameter. They're available in both eight and nine inch widths. They actually offer a staggered kit with both sizes, which is what we went with. Kit also comes with center caps and all the lug nuts for installation. As for tires, we called on our good friends at Summit Racing for a set of Mickey Thompsons. Up front, we chose the Street Comp, which is an ultra high performance tire that'll give us the traction and handling we need. But in the rear, we decided to go with Mickey's new ET Street SS Drag Radials. This is a super sticky tire that's gonna give us the traction we need on those launches, but it's also DOT compliant. Now, the reason we went with these is because we've got something special planned for the underhood of that Chevelle, but you're gonna have to learn about that later. Of course, we pre-measured for these very wheels when we ordered our brakes, so we don't have to worry about any clearance issues here. Well, that does it for our Chevelle's chassis, and I have to say it looks really good. From that freshly powder coated frame to that bulletproof rear end and all those new suspension components that hold it together. Yeah, we still have a whole lot of work to be done on the body itself. We got the rust repair we have to still do, not to mention all that sanding and bodywork and paint. But that's going to have to come a little later down the road. But I have to say, the chassis turned out super sweet. What do you think? I think it looks great. Let's leave it under the lights for a while. All right, buddy. There's nothing worse than going out to the garage and hitting the key on your ride only to have nothing happen. Well, the way to fix that is to get yourself one of these Optima Red Top batteries. The Red Top delivers a super strong five second burst of starting power and outlasts traditional batteries in demanding cranking and starting applications by up to three times. It's virtually spill proof, can be mounted in any direction and recharges faster than your run of the mill battery. If any of you guys out there in the middle of restoring a 68 to 72 Chevelle, I got a part here that may pique your interest. It's a body bushing kit from Original Parts Group. The kit includes everything you need to mount the body to the chassis, including the upper and lower cushions, washers, and hardware. Also, they've done their homework to save you time by numbering every bushing and including a chart to tell you where each one goes. And for you chalk mark guys out there, these steel inserts have that factory zinc coating that you'll be looking for. We're all out of time for now, so until next time, y'all keep it between the ditches.